the challenge, the opportunity to connect. The 1960s, a time of imagination and change, a time of anger and fear. The 1960s, a program called Challenge. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Looked at our connections, our divisions, through the lens of faith. Nearly 60 years later, during these challenging times, we'll take a new look at our divisions, our connections, in a new program called Challenge 2.0. News fatigue is just one symptom of the complexity, change, and emotional stress of our time. As one close friend of mine likes to say, you just can't make this stuff up. We often wish it was just made up because it is overwhelming. One result is a pervading sense of despair, which in turn has led to tribalism, us versus them. Is it reasonable to maintain a sense of hope, and how can we do that? That is the focus of our Challenge 2.0 program today, despair and hope in an overwhelming world. Well, I would like to introduce our guests with uh, sincere thanks for taking time out of your busy schedules to participate with us. Uh, first, I would like to introduce R Rabbi Johanna Kinberg of uh, Congregation Kolami in Woodenville. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, Reverend Terry Kylo of the Tracy Levine Center, which of course is the body on which I also serve on the board and that is producing this. Uh, also neighbors in faith and an ordained Lutheran minister. And Imam Adam Jamal of the Muslim Association of Puget Sound in Redmond. And I understand you're a recent transplant to the Puget yes. Sound area, so welcome on several thank accounts. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. I think it doesn't take much time to look at the various events that we see in the news, uh, in public discussion, to wonder, is this world truly going crazy? And that is the genesis behind our topic, despair and hope uh, in an overwhelming world. What I'd like to do is begin with just perhaps a very brief summary or uh, touch point on something that has given you a sense of despair and something also that's given you a sense of hope. Uh, Johanna, perhaps we could begin with you. Mm. I mean, something that's giving me a sense of despair is the um, continued presence um, of white nationalists in our area, in the Pacific Northwest, having grown up here my whole life, um, and that continued sense of lack of security for um, minorities in this area. And what gives me hope really is just all the wonderful interfaith work that's been happening the last couple of years, um, people choosing to come together. Um, and to create light together. Mm -hmm. Terry. Yeah, I think the thing that, in addition to what Johanna said, that's really on my mind these days as I drive around or as I go out for hikes, is uh, the impact of, of uh, the industrialized world, uh, our industrialized economy on the larger environment. Mm -hmm. uh, the other day I, I saw a couple of eagles flying over my house, and I thought you know, how beautiful they were in their flight. And yet I also wondered, are, are they still going to be here in 50 years or 100 years in mm -hmm. the same way? Adam. So I guess we start with the bad news first. <laughs> and um, when it comes to, I guess, things that give me that, that despair, we live in an age where we have so much information, we have access to so much knowledge, mm -hmm. but we find that we're so ignorant still. Um, and part of that is social media. It's this double-edged sword where it puts you in a bubble mm -hmm. because it just gives you the things you're more likely, more likely to like so that you use the, the system more. And so that makes you despair because it's like everyone's in their bubble even though they're supposed to be using social media to really see the mm -hmm. world. Um, and I guess that also gives me hope at the same time that um, if you do give people a chance, they can surprise you. And some of the work that we've been doing with Pastor Terry and others um, has allowed us to see that basically uh, mm -hmm. because We've seen people from very different backgrounds um, kind of come together and want to listen and they want to learn. And so that's been incredibly good. I think one of the surprises, and especially when we talk about the events or the issues that we've just uh, briefly elaborated, is the book uh, by Steven Pinker, uh, The Better Angels of Our Nature. And he argues that as a species, we are becoming less violent and he offers a number of reasons for optimism. Bill Gates said it was one of his favorite books that he's read over the last 10 years. Do you agree that we are becoming less violent, a little bit more enlightened as a species, 
at times seems to fly in the face of what we read in the news each day. And however you feel, why or why not? And Adam, I might begin with you on that one. I was recently a part of a youth discussion um, after the shootings in Florida. And we were asking about gun violence in schools mm -hmm. and, and what the kids feel about it. And one of the kids said, it's just another shooting. And so these kids have become desensitized to this mm -hmm. fact that these mass shootings are taking place in our schools in this country. And um, that's incredibly upsetting. And I don't think, I think when we look at the reality, we have a lot of work to do mm -hmm. um, to, to stop this and to change this. And I think the, that specific book, I think some of that research is disputed. You know, it could be that we're just as, we, we're, just, we're, we're at our natural disposition mm -hmm. for, for fear and to be distracted by propaganda and things like that. Um, but it's up to us to come together and band together and try to change that. Yeah, there are certainly a lot of academics in the fields he references that question Pinker's assumptions. Mm -hmm. um, and he, he, his knowledge of theology is really primitive. It's almost as if he just learned theology from watching a few minutes of the Trinity Broadcasting Network. Um, and so many of his assumptions seem like they're a little bit shaky, but um, the reality, that the reason that people like the book a little bit though, is that uh, a lot of folk are experiencing despair about mm -hmm. the future of humanity. Um, but the, the challenge is uh, the earth isn't the Titanic. Mm -hmm. It's neither unsinkable, nor is it doomed. And, and I think that in this culture, we've had a kind of a, a, a theology of optimism, that everything's going to be okay, that's led to kind of some passivity mm -hmm. that is not really good for us and for the larger world. And so what I, what I, th what I think about, um, about his books is that um, we're going to have to work for it. Uh, individuals and communities and governments and institutions are going to have to work and decide every day to work for the long-term thriving of our world. And, and so, um, you know, I, I think his book helps in a way, but I think it also can lead to, to some really passive optimism, which is just as, just as, as bad as passive despair. So I feel like my life attests to perhaps what he writes in his book in that 50 years ago, I wouldn't have been able to exist. Mm -hmm. Couldn't be a female rabbi. My you know, great-grandmother from Morocco was illiterate. Um, my congregation is housed in a church. That would have been unthinkable. So, so many things about my reality every day would have been unthinkable in the past. Mm -hmm. The world is moving towards greater justice and unity. And I, and I see so many people, whether they're religious or not, who believe in a unifying um, theory of the universe, mm -hmm. that we're all interconnected, and that my actions, the way I treat the earth or other people, influences them, and that we have this power to bring more good into the world. So my experience is that yes, so many more people who weren't included in society or in um, didn't have pathways for their joy or for their full expression do today, and that has to be a good thing. Adam, you brought up a very interesting point, and it's one that I've hit on a number of different times in different ways, and that is when I was growing up, we won't go into how long ago that was, uh, it was most of my contemporaries had a couple of different sources for news and information, typically one of the three major networks, a newspaper, two in the community, and even if you came from very different backgrounds, even if you had different opinions on things, there was a commonality of that information. And now, as you pointed out so well, that there are bubbles that people can operate in and only get things that reinforce their particular view of the world and maybe even isolate them even further. Do any of you have ideas, suggestions in terms of how we can counter that? I guess, do you agree that's the case? And if so, how can we counter that tendency? Well, um, I think having that face-to-face -face interaction. Mm -hmm. One of the things I was reading was that people that have met a Muslim have a positive view of Islam and Muslims. Um, and people that have not met a Muslim, they're much more likely to have a negative view. Mm -hmm. And what that tells you is we just need to meet people. We just need to have that face-to-face -face interaction. And as I said before, people will surprise you. Um, there's a lot to be learned on, on, on every side, from every perspective. Well, you know, I think the human brain is, is really geared toward paying attention to what is a threat to us. 
Mm -hmm. right? And so it, it seems to me that, that a lot of what people are digesting in the way of news, whether it's on social media or the web or, or traditional journalism, is sort of based <coughs> on a threat perspective. And, you know, but sh sugar tastes good, but if you eat too much sugar, you get sick, right? And I think what's happening in part is that people are ingesting so much fear, so much sense of threat mm -hmm. um, during what is, for many people, a pretty, pretty peaceful time where there has been some really good um, inclusion of people and, and greater human rights for everyone. Um, and I think, and, and, and that I think we, we've kind of gotten a bit toxic with, with fearfulness, mm -hmm. with a sense of threat. We also, as, as Adam said, um, have a tremendous amount of, of confirmation bias Mm -hmm. as part of our nature, that we tend to receive the information that, that confirms our perspective and we tend to reject that, which is different. And I think really right now we need to encourage people to go out and learn from people directly from those people and not to learn about them from third parties mm -hmm. as much. Johanna. And religious institutions can really be the ones who facilitate that because the reality is that when you go to your religious institution on a weekly or daily basis, that's confirmation bias too, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's the when you go to one place and you say, that's my faith and that's who I am, it builds your worldview. So if you can make part of that worldview to go out into the world and meet other people and interact, that's, that's, that's holy work. But religious institutions can be just as dangerous as social media. Mm -hmm. um, it's really about having um, an intention to use your tool. So you make a choice when you, about what's gonna be in your feed and you can choose to have lots of different perspectives. So how do you go about doing that? I know that each of you in different ways have been involved in reaching out. Uh, maybe you could each share some of the examples of things that you've done that people watching us right now might say, gee, maybe I can do something like that. Um, the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, he said, if you want to go to heaven, spread peace and feed people. <laughs> and so that's what we've been trying to do. <laughs> Whenever we have an open house at our mosque, we'll feed people. And we have a wonderful Moroccan chef. <laughs> you said you were from Morocco. Yeah. So <laughs> we have a wonderful Moroccan chef who cooks amazing food. And uh, people really come together for that. You know, they, they break, when, you, when you break bread together, you're actually breaking barriers. Mm -hmm. So I think sharing that is, is an amazing thing. Just going out for coffee, getting to know each other, I think that's really important. Yeah. I've done over 45 public events trying to create space for Muslim voices to be heard. And, and in a lot of places in the state where no one's ever heard a Muslim voice in public before. Mm -hmm. and, but I, what I tell people in those settings is that we often make this too hard. We think we have to resolve like, you know, thousands of years of theological debate or, 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 or resolve foreign policy disputes. Mm -hmm. When that's not really where we start. I mean, we start by eating together and playing together and sharing stories and maybe doing some social service, you know, kind of projects together in the community. Mm -hmm. And what happens in the middle of that is that people begin to recognize people as human beings. And I think that's one of the key challenges of our time is that we're struggling to recognize human beings and the value of human beings. Johanna, what's, and you mentioned a particular program that you have going uh, at your congregation. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, I've been doing this program called Daughters of Abraham um, with Anila from MAPS and different um, female Christian clergy where we go and we speak about the role of women in our respective traditions mm -hmm. and um, really have conversations to break down myths barriers about how women function in the Abrahamic faiths with a special emphasis on dispelling myths about Muslim women um, and to show where there's the strength that we have all together um, as, as women and as leaders in our community. Thank you so much. You've been each talking about uh, elements that I think underscore the contribution that our respective faiths can offer not only people within our congregations, within our uh, religious institutions, but without. But we know here in the Pacific Northwest, it's listed as one of the areas of the country, if not the area that has the smallest proportion of people declaring an affiliation with a given faith. How do you get around that? How do you perhaps open people up to that message? And how even perhaps beyond the boundaries of your given religious institution, do you still manage to reach out and get those one-on-one -on -one interactions going? 
you know, I've always been impressed and amazed by the concept of placebo in medicine. Mm -hmm. And that basically means that whenever you wanna test a new drug, you have to make sure it does better than someone who's taking just medicine that doesn't actually do anything physically, mm -hmm. but it makes a difference because they believe they're getting better. And so that just shows you the, the power of belief um, and the power of, of knowing that there's meaning in things. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people have been searching for that meaning outside of faith because they've lost trust in faith and in religion. And so it's the, the job of, of religion and people who practice religion to, 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 to rebuild that trust with mm -hmm. people. And that's what I'm aiming to do, and that's what you know, many of my colleagues are aiming to do, yeah. <laughs> Any other perspectives on that, perhaps? Well, often, you know, especially in American society, your value is with what you produce, mm -hmm. what you are in the economy. And religious institutions and communities of faith happen to be places where you actually can be valued and um, assessed outside of your value in the economy. Mm -hmm. And that is such a relief to be able to walk in a place and, and know that it's your good deeds, your smile, your care for your fellow human being and the planet where your merit lies. Mm -hmm. And so providing um, opportunities for people in our society to step out of um, capitalism, to step out of this sense of your only va value for what you produce is a rehumanizing effect. Mm -hmm. And I think it will make people ultimately more compassionate when they go out there on the streets is to re connect with their own humanity every week, day, whatever ritual it is you do. Terry, I saw you nodding. Yeah, I think the, 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 there's an, a great opportunity for faith communities in this time mm -hmm. where, where the number of people participating in faith communities has been reduced. It's an opportunity for faith communities and faith traditions to go back to their, to their core. Mm -hmm. To, and to think really carefully, like, what is it that our tradition's teaching us? And I, I believe that for mine, it's that, it's that God is healing and creating the world. And that we find meaning as people by participating in that. Mm -hmm. And then faith communities, once they get to some kind of deeper assessment of what they're called to do, need to not just talk about it in their, in their worship services or their, their classrooms, but... but to encourage people to begin to find meaning in their own lives by actively working mm -hmm. for the healing and the creation of the world, for instance. And, uh, and so I think part of the loss of trust in church is, of course, representative of the loss of inst the trust in institutions generally in mm -hmm. our country. But I think part of it comes because, speaking for Christians, we have not always done what we said. And there's been a lack of integrity there m much of the time. There was the... Uh belief, and I, one of my favorite sayings that I encountered recently was that we used to believe that the sun rotated around the earth. We no longer believe that, but we still believe that the rest of creation rotates around us. And so you've spoken of a deeper sense of who we are. How difficult is that to get the message across to the younger people within your respective traditions? I work with young people. And um, I was reading about how we can actually attract young people to our mm -hmm. institutions. And the things that really attract young people to, to programming and to things that happen at the mosque or the church or the synagogue or wherever are things like to see their faith in action, like Terry just said, mm -hmm. um, to see diversity, um, to see that their faith is relevant to what they're actually living in real life. Mm -hmm. And so not necessarily always talking about things that happened thousands or hundreds of years ago, mm -hmm. but focusing on what's happening now and how faith can impact them on a daily basis. Any other perspectives on that? I think also providing them with a vision of what the world can look like. Mm -hmm. You know, this is in our prayer service in the synagogue, we have this prayer at the end that says that on that day, God's name will be one, the world will be one. And mm -hmm. that's that sense of like on that day, we're walking towards something, we're moving towards something, and you can be a part of that body um, if you would like to be, if you wanna tap into that. Yeah, I think that we can lift up a, 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 a third option to, to despair or to a passive optimism. Mm -hmm. we, I think we, what, we, what we are called to do, what I think our traditions tried to do in their, in their time and try to, con to continue to do is to look at the world honestly. Mm -hmm. I mean, what is this world like right now? How is it like not only for the wealthy, but how is it like for the most vulnerable? Mm -hmm. And to look at that honestly and at the same time do something deeper than optimism. Actually hope, you know, which is always a risky thing, but to hope 
um, with our actions, with our bodies, with our voices, with our community for a future that God is bringing that involves healing for everyone. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that's an important thing that our traditions can offer. We alluded to the sense of separation from other groups and the need to reconnect with that. Tribalism seems to be heavily based, as you pointed out, on our fear of each other. And we know that as human beings, that's hardwired into us, uh, the flight or fr uh, fright syndrome. And uh, how can we overcome that sense of basic fear? You've alluded to that in contacting people, but do you have a little bit more uh, expansive view of how you begin to counter that sense? Um, Jeff, the Quran, it tells us that people have been made into tribes and nations in order that we may get to know one another, hmm. to learn from each other. And I think that's really what this is about. Um, recently, we had um, the first Muslim in Congress, Keith Ellison, he came to visit our community. And one of the things he was saying is when you feel that fear and that kind of negative portrayal of Muslims in the media and so on, you feel like you want to close up, close all your doors and just kind of stay at home and just focus on, on you and your family. Um, but he said in, instead what needs to happen is we need to put ourselves out there even more. Mm -hmm. And we need to make sure that our voices are heard. And we need to make sure that people know who we, what, who we are and what we're really about. I think the core of the Abrahamic tradition, as I understand it, was all about helping to recognize other human beings, helping to reduce tribalism. Mm -hmm. So instead of there being different gods fighting up in the heavens when tribes fight below, there's one God saying, stop fighting, mm -hmm. because you're all part of my creation, you're all part of, of my extended family, you're all third cousins. And I think, um, but, but tribalism increases when there is a sense of scarcity, mm -hmm. when there is a sense of, of fear generally. And, and there are huge changes taking place in our culture, economically and otherwise, that are causing some people to feel scarcity. Mm -hmm. But there's also this ingestion of constant negativity, which is also kind of um, overwhelming people a bit. And so I think the very core of our tradition is about recognizing other human beings as human, mm -hmm. even if they worship or sing or dress or speak differently. And I, I would like to see us get back to the core of that again. I think it was pointed out that uh, if we look at our exposures to people of different cultures, we probably see Seattle metro area, uh, even in a smaller suburban area, more people from more cultures, more ethnic groups, more different faiths than probably our grandparents saw in a lifetime, at least certainly a year. Uh, so that's a point of richness, as you said, of encounter, but it can also be, as we've seen, a point of some tension. Uh, perhaps each of you might share something within your experience that has been particularly hopeful. And I, I can think of this past year, couple of years, we've seen a lot of uh, expressions of negativity, of uh, uh, graffiti and so forth. I know that has been the case uh, at MAPS. I know it's been the case in some synagogues, some Christian churches as well. But I've also seen examples where people from different faiths have come together and said, that's not all right with us. So I guess I might ask each of you to give us a sense of some instances that are ongoing programs or ongoing efforts, maybe just on an interpersonal level, uh, that really give you that sense of hope that this encounter, this strength of encounter is really happening. Well, the, the first thing that comes to mind is on a national level, we have, after the Florida shooting, um, a lot of these kids, these young people, mm -hmm. they came together and they were speaking out and they were, you know, pointing fingers at the senators and trying to, to, to make change and really putting themselves out there. And that was really amazing to see. And that's something about these young people that they're not necessarily about being on the left or being on the right, mm -hmm. uh, but more about what's really better for this country as a whole. And the second thing uh, on a more local level is um, recently we had a conference at our mosque, um, which basically talked about um, you know, coming together and trying to, to move away from, from fear and, and, and being more about faith and more about building relationships. And so that was a really great conference and I got to meet so many people. Um, Pastor Terry was a part of that. Um, Yo Johanna, Rabbi Johanna was also a part of that. So that was, that was really amazing to see. Well, when I was um, in high school, our synagogue in Eugene was shot up by neo-Nazis and it was during Passover. And so we had a group of interfaith people come and they held hands during our community Passover Seder and stood all the way around the synagogue 
um, while we were having our Seder. And then many years later, decades later, I was invited to MAPS to put my hands in the cement of the new sign after the old sign had been desecrated. And for me, that was just a sign that there is a strain of interfaith, mutual support, and loving mm -hmm. kindness that has existed really my whole lifetime in the Northwest. And as consistent as the white national, uh, nationalism has been, the mutual support and loving kindness of the interfaith community has also always been there. And I know that we will continue to be there for each other and open our doors for each other to help each other feel safe. And that gives me a, a great sense of hope. Yeah, I see, I go out and do a lot of work in smaller towns. Mm -hmm. And I see people there, every bit as committed to recognizing other people as neighbors, to um, fighting for and standing with the human rights of every single per person and every, and every uh, culture and, and tribe and religion. And it's been really remarkable from, from Blaine all the way you know, down to, to uh, Vancouver, Washington. Mm -hmm. We're seeing uh, faith communities come together, people of non-faith traditions coming together, eating together, recognizing their humanity, and standing with the most vulnerable people in that community. As each of you have said, it's that simple opportunity to say hello, to initiate an encounter with somebody, can really begin to make a difference. Uh, I think each one of you for all the differences that you're making and for participating in this program. I hope you'll come back and join us again. And I thank all of you for joining us on this Challenge 2.0. Thank you very much.